Good afternoon. A few weeks ago, I received an email that went just like this. I have a park. We have some people that want to play. Can you help? My first response was, OK, so where's this park? Because I literally know all the parks in New Orleans. And then secondly, who was this person, John? After a few email exchanges, we decided to meet at what was Cabrini Park at the edge of the French Quarter. Our meeting time came, and there I was standing in the middle of this field, and up walks John. She was about 5'4", the 60-plus-year-old woman with an obvious artistic flair. See, John had this beautiful jewelry on, the fedora, and a braid coming down the side. After we went through our normal intro banter, she confirmed what I thought. She was an art collector and had renovated a beautiful Creole cottage that she told me would have to tour after our official business. John began to tell me about this park and the history of it. See, it was once the site of a McDonough school. It had been demolished. And then it was the site of what she called the undesirables, and most recently had been default a dog park. John and I continued to talk about how this space mattered. It was at the intersection of three very rich culturally and socially diverse neighborhoods of Treme, Marigny, and the French Quarter. By the end of our conversation, we were finishing each other's sentences, and we agreed on one simple thing, that parks matter, play matters. And I wanted to find play for you, because the first thing people think about are little kids and how we learn, or when we throw out play as this, this sort of um, solution to how to become more creative. For me, play is the power of a space and a place to create connections amongst people. See, John and I were a perfect example of that. And what other world would the artist and the athlete have met? A park can be a vehicle for creating social organization and community. If it doesn't catalyze something, it's not going to be a great contribution to a neighborhood. In 2009, I set out to do something really simple, y'all. Just have adults play. <laughs> I even came up with a catchy little tagline, which is a little cheesy, meet, greet, and compete. See, 200 people sat in the audience just like you and decided with their vote that play no was what New Orleans needed. See, there were an unprecedented number of young professionals that had moved to the city, and we were the perfect way to engage and retain these folks. But there was really one problem. There was no place to play. See, Katrina had destroyed the, the parks that were left over and put a nail in the coffin of an eroding recreation system. It was literally an uphill battle. Parks were being used by the semi-pro team, the charter school kids, and everyone in between. New Orleans has approximately 220 green spaces that it manages and controls. Of those, 120 of them are actually park or playground. Only 30 of them offer programs designated for youth, um, either recreational programs or some sort of play stuff. Absolutely zero of them are adult spaces. So once I figured this out, I realized that I had to do more than just try to run sports leagues, that it was a higher calling, and I needed to focus on really getting people to understand this thing called recreation. See, for me, it was a quality of life thing. If you didn't have anywhere to be active, you didn't have anywhere to play, your city wasn't complete. My first stop, City Hall. <laughs> That's where we all go when we get upset, right? <laughs> See, I used to drive around. Um, I guess I would compare it to the way people look at shoes, but I would look at vacant lots and not so vacant lots and dream about spaces and what we could create. Um, and so I thought I had found one near downtown. And we thought we could turn it into this, a full play space where residents could enjoy um, activities, fields, all the kind of good stuff. See, I lived in a bunch of cities. I most recently moved from Baltimore that turned their inner harbor into not only a tourist destination, but had included play space in it. I knew that Boston had been really creative about how they incorporated space. And there were numerous examples in DC and in New York. We really didn't have to go far. If you go to Baton Rouge, they do a pretty good job at it, too. The city said no. 
But that did not stop me from doing the work that I wanted to do and spreading the message about how parks really are integral to not only preservation, but expansion of our community. So fast forward a little bit to 2011. If you all remember, there's a little thing called the NFL lockout. Millions of Americans and New Orleanians were so anxious that football wouldn't come back. <laughs> business, it was business as usual for us. We were still running leagues and doing all the things that we do. And then these two guys showed up, Malcolm Jenkins and Roman Harper, both hugely successful, popular Saints players. So of course, we were super excited. <laughs> um, and they were so gracious, and they came up to us, and they were like, can we play? They even wore shirts to match the guys they were playing with. After we picked our jaws up off the floor, and we asked, and I started to think about it, what reason would two NFL players come and join our tiny little league? There were a couple things. One, they were playing with their friends. Two, their million-dollar facility on Airline Drive was not available to them. And we were playing in one of two renovated spaces that had been renovated, fields that had been renovated after the storm. So it was a no-brainer. If we thought we had arrived when they showed up, <laughs> then this guy came. <laughs> Again, no autographs, no entourage, showed up with a cooler and some friends, all to, to play and just have a good time. See, the luxury that I get in doing my work is that I get to see the many faces of the people of New Orleans. I get to see the doctor from Ochsner, who plays Wednesday night softball, the seventh grade charter school teacher, who's a kickball player at night on Thursdays, the sewage and waterboard guy who plays football on Monday nights. See, parks create a natural gathering place for people. It's an opportunity for folks to create real connections, deep connections through shared experiences. Continue forward, parks also promote health and wellness. When we think about all the stats in our country, um, I don't need to repeat them to you. We're obese, we eat too much, we don't walk enough. Um, parks help mitigate these things. Green spaces, viable, active, program green spaces help mitigate this. Whether it's obesity, whether it's wellness, or whether we think about crime as a public health issue. When we embarked on working with the city of New Orleans in their Midnight Basketball Initiative, we knew it was a no-brainer. The city of New Orleans has high crime. It happens on weekends. Young men aged 16 to 24 are generally most vulnerable to commit these crimes and creating an outlet for them to be safe and off the streets helps deter crime. We've worked with thousands of young men over the last 10, 10 seasons to help with this initiative. Finally, I think parks help complete the canvas of our community. It allows us to enjoy the beauty of what, of what we see. Imagine this. All the indicators of re revitalization are happening in your community. There's a new school building coming up. There's houses being renovated or being built. There's even a cute little coffee shop on the corner where people are hanging out. Now imagine in the middle of that space is an empty, vacant playground, full of trash, full of graffiti, with nothing happening on it. If you want to bring it even closer to home, think about Aretha Castle Haley. We have this brand new facility here, beautiful restaurants going up, and just two blocks away, there's a vacant playground that looks more like blight than a playground. See, I think we all can be advocates for this, either a vocal one or a silent one. Vocal advocates we all know. Those are the people who get on the news, they go to city hall meetings, they do shine a light on the issues at hand. But I think even more powerful are silent advocates. See, silent advocates are the folks who go in their backyard or in their garages and say, you know what, I have some extra paint. I can paint a park bench or spruce up the park a little bit. Or the guy who brings everybody over, entices them with a little bit of beer, and says, hey, let's create a plan on how are we going to pick up the trash in our neighborhood? How are we going to keep the, mow the lawn mowed? See, silent advocates are even more powerful and often unrecognized. I think we were able to work with a lot of silent advocates most recently when we decided to renovate Annunciation Playground. See, we were able to get the volunteer parents from the special needs school, the residents who lived in the apartment complex right next to it, 
and a guy who I will say was an amateur kickball player by night and a professional landscaper by day. The park had a lot of divots and issues going on. You can see some of them here. And so a, a army of volunteers, at least about 30 of us, went through, and it was pretty labor intensive, filling all in the sand, cleaning up spaces, cutting back trees and all that good stuff, and then laying down brand new sod. One park, many silent advocates. New Orleans has undergone tremendous, tremendous growth in the last 10 years. We all see it. Brand new buildings downtown, new houses, and if you can even believe it, more places to eat. <laughs> Yet we have neglected the final linchpin in our redevelopment process, our public green spaces. I don't make any grand claims that if we just put a park in the playground, that things will all magically be better. But I will claim that if we make this a priority for everyone, including residents uptown in New Orleans East, Treme, and everywhere in between, that life in the Big Easy would be that much easier. Thank you so much.